Roll call by the town clerk, please. Chairman Carson. Here. Councilor Berry. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Roberts. Present. Councilor Swift Kayata. Here. Councilor Watson. Here. Representative Pucci. Representative Elia. And Manager McGovern. And town clerk. Present. <laughs> Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Reports and correspondence to the council. Councillor Barry. Uh, just a, a quick note here. I received a, a telephone call from a taxpayer who was quite concerned about an article that uh, appeared in the uh, Cape uh, Courier. And uh, I said, just a minute, I'll, I'll look it up and call you back, because uh, uh, I was concerned. It seemed that, uh, that they proposed to have a diner on the property <laughs> next door. And I think some people in the community might have actually believed this April Fool joke. <laughs> so uh, it was right on the front page, and there was a picture of a lighthouse with a diner and everything. So I think it would uh, be only fair to let all the folks at home know that there is no proposal to put a diner right next door to the town hall. But that was a joke, and uh, we'll relegate it to that. The gentleman who had called me, one of the upstanding members of our community, had not read to the last page there, so he didn't know about it. <laughs> I've been caught, actually, two or three times by that over the last 10 years. I, I think we should let the folks know about that. They're always very creative, though. I thought that was a particularly creative one. I agree. The, the most creative one I remember, though, was going from, I think, Cape Elizabeth, a uh, bridge from Cape Elizabeth to Peaks Island. Yeah. <laughs> over to, you know. <laughs> OK, uh, are there any other reports and correspondence? Councilor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, uh, I'd just like to report that the uh, Playground Study Committee is uh, making progress. They're now meeting about every other week. Uh, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Good. I, and I asked you to do it. I said it would only be three or four meetings. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> Town manager's report. No report. No report at this time. Are there any items for citizens' discussion that are not on, to the, on the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move to the minutes of the March 14th meeting. Join your packet. Entertain a motion if there are no errors or omissions. Uh, I'll move that the, that the minutes be uh, accepted as read. Second. So moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Item number 84, a request from the Cape Elizabeth High School students to construct and place a skateboard park. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that this, this item has just come to us, and um, I know the students have been working hard on their plans, and, and uh, one of the issues that they've probably had some ideas about, which but we do not, are any possible locations for it. We're here tonight to listen to the students, to hear what their presentation is, and we have asked the school board, I think a couple of possible locations may be on school property, so the school board is going to act and make a recommendation back to us. So we will not be able to act on it, but I promise the students that we're going to get it right back onto the agenda when we hear from the school board at the next meeting and act on it, so you have the time. But we can't act on it tonight because we can't make a decision on location until we hear from the school board. But we do want your report. We do want to hear everything you have to say about it because we don't know anything. <laughs> All right. Um, that's good. We don't want to your name and where you live. Uh, would you just, first of all, you could just pull that up a little, point it up a little bit so the audience at home can hear you and tell us your name and what year you're in. Okay, I'm uh, Michael Solak. I'm a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School. This is that on? John Harriman, uh, another senior. Travis Hahn and uh, Ben Machievsky. And uh, yeah, we're interested in uh, building a skateboard park uh, in town. Uh, we we feel it's uh, needed because of a strong demand of a. Uh, we have more skaters now, and uh, it's it's becoming like a, a pretty popular sport. Uh, uh, just when we arrived in, we saw some kids out in the parking lot skating around. And I think that kind of shows right there that there is, like right now, there is no place really for uh, students to uh, skate. And so we we felt as part of our STP project, that STP project, our uh, senior transition project, uh, that we could we could build that during our free time because we 
the STP starts on uh, May 14th. We get out of school early. We get three weeks to do a project. And uh, this started last year. And last year, it, uh, it was 5,000 hours of like, community service from the students. And uh, this is what we chose to do. And we thought it would just be a good idea because there is really no, no place in Cape Elizabeth. A lot of other places are uh, building uh, skateboard parks. There's a few in Portland. We have some pictures of I believe we sent those mm, around. Yes. Uh, and so that's, that's basically what we wanted to do was just to build one so that the town could have uh, and the kids could all have somewhere to go. Um, we, th we think that there's enough people now where, I mean, it would get used enough. And uh, we, we think we found a spot for it at the, uh, the, senior, the senior parking lot at the uh, high school. Oh. Um, Mr. Ely said that we could probably take off some of it to build the skateboard park where parking spots, spots would be. But uh, he said he could probably live with a few missing if we had this sort of thing because it would get used and there, there's a lot of people that would like to have this happen. And so he said that he could, he could you know, spare a few uh, spots for us to be able to build there uh, when we start our projects. And we, we feel that it would do pretty good uh, to have for all the kids here to be able to use it. I mean, most of them, like they go places like parking lots, like the kids were, and uh, like around church grants and stuff. And, and like they get, some people get in trouble for going places uh, where they're not supposed to, to skate just because they don't really don't have any place to skate. I know a lot of, I know uh, some people go to Portland just, just so that they can skate around because uh, they have the nice parks. I believe that's the one you're looking at. Uh, Well, I guess that's really, we're looking, well, we're looking for uh, donations, actually, too, uh, looking for money. We're, we're going to uh, hold some fundraisers, and uh, we're, we're also going to use uh, the recycled wood at the dump. Uh, we're going to use all the recycled wood we can get. Uh, we'll take any donations, and uh, we just, we just want to make sure that there's a place for kids to go, and we feel that this would be a good project, not only for this year, but for future years, like next year, they could maybe build on it, the seniors next year, and then, uh, or do maintenance on it or anything else uh, that it could use, that it could just become a bigger and bigger thing. And, and we feel that at the senior parking lot, which is right uh, above the tennis courts, uh, next to the base, low, below the baseball field, uh, right there, it'd be right, uh, right in the center of town where everybody would know where it is. Uh, High schoolers can go right there, right after school. Middle schoolers are right there. Uh, so anybody that wants to do it, it, it's right in the middle, so it's not too far away. And uh, I guess you get oh, you Yeah, it's, it's just like a regular sport too. Like you have baseball and stuff, and you got your baseball fields and that. You know, the skateboarders in Cape really don't have any place to go, and there's a there is a bunch of people that really care about the sport. They really like to do it. it there's a lot, uh, skateboarding has been up and coming for a while now, and I believe there's about 20 to 30 people who regularly skate. You've probably seen them on uh, roads and stuff, and people get kicked out of the roads all the time. They're public roads, obviously. It's not a safe place to skateboard. And so, you know, like, this would be safer for a lot of the people, and it would get them, keep them out of trouble. Like, people skateboard at churches, like was said, um, the school, and they used to cement things there instead because they don't have ramps. It ruins stuff. People don't like it. People, it gives us a bad name because we have no other place to go. And it would just really help to have a place to go, and it would keep a lot of people out of trouble. I will say that now that you have a location, which we did not know about, it's possible the council may act tonight. I, I'm certainly prepared to, so I will check for that now that you've given us the location. And I, I see that Mr. Ely is here, and, and um, it's, I, I would ask him to comment as well. Yes, continue. Um, yeah, another thing was I was just going to say Mr. Ely is here. Uh, he, he really wants this to happen. A lot of people want this to happen. He spoke, I didn't speak directly, but he spoke with uh, Officer Gaspar and, uh, about this idea, and he thought it was a great idea. I spoke with uh, Mr. Sweeney about it, and uh, he thought it was a good idea, and we had a meeting with Mr. McGovern, and uh, he seemed pretty enthusiastic about the idea. So, is, is there some, in the, in the construction of these products, is there some... Super, I mean, do you have some, I mean, I see the drawings that you have here. Are there some 
safety issues? I mean, are they built all built a certain way, or do you just? Um, yeah. Well, yes. The, I mean, they can. You have to build them the right way to make them uh, safe, and we're going to be contacting in, uh, the architects of uh, the Portland ones, mm -hmm. and uh, we also, uh, uh, Mr. Strout, uh, the phys ed teacher in middle school, will also be helping with us, as well as uh, one of the math teachers up at the high school, um, Mr. Jadoni, who's excellent with uh, building things. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he built his own house, I know that, so, I mean, he's, so we're, we're getting a lot of support from some older people, and they'll help us to uh, get this thing the right way. And, so it'd be nice and safe, and it'll be a nice place to go to for the for the kids and the older kids and anybody. Okay, that's that's great. I, I'm going to ask Mr. Ely to also speak this evening, and then the council can ask questions to you and <coughs> to Mr. Ely. Good evening. My name is Dwight Ely. I'm the assistant principal at the high school. Appreciate you um, entertaining this idea tonight. Um, I don't have too much to add to what Mike has already said. The, uh, the location, uh, I, sh I should say, is a possibility. We haven't taken it to the administration and the school board. But uh, that would be the high school's recommendation in that the, um, the timing <coughs> uh, seems uh, to coincide perfectly. Seniors do this senior transition project starting about mid-May. And so the senior parking lot, which is the parking lot just below the baseball diamond, uh, down near the tennis courts, okay, will basically be empty um, from then on. And so that gives us a long period of time to have it uh, in place to see what kind of use it does get and to see how it's accepted by the town. So it's, a, it's an area that we can do without during this particular time period. But <clears throat> as I said, we need to take that to the, um, to the school board. I'm still prepared if contingent upon the school board approving it. So now questions from councilors. Councilor Roberts. Thank you. Uh, how large an area do you normally figure this is going to take? I'm assuming that the parking lot at some point is not going to be the permanent home of this. And is it portable enough to be moved around once you've got it built? Yeah, we are going to build it portable. That's one of the plans. Like, there's a lot of locations around town that have been mentioned. So like, you know, like, it should be portable enough to be moved to another area if we find another area. And uh, we're planning on building it portable. And uh, we're not totally sure of the size yet. Like, depending on the size of the ramps built and, like, you know, how much use it's going to get depends on how large it should be. And we're just, we're working with what we know right now. I think we're, we have, like, four spaces on either side of the parking lot right now. And we'll work with that and see how it works out. For what it's worth, I used to ride one of those, too. I think it was 1962. <laughs> <coughs> Previous generation of skateboards. <laughs> Councilor Fritz. So it would not actually be on the pavement in the parking lot and using spaces? Is that's, that... that's, that's where it will be, yes. Uh, like, it'll take up a few spaces, but uh, like I said before, Mr. Ely said he can probably live without it if we had this such a thing, because it'd be... It's, like I think he said like last week, it was one of these projects that we had to try, and he wants us to try, so. I, and it would be yes on the pavement, and we're gonna, like he said, make it portable so that we, if we can find a more permanent home for it later on, then you can you know, just pack it up and move it. But, uh, so it would be moved during the school year? If, well, when we're gonna start building it as, uh, when we start STP and all the seniors will be gone, so we'll have that free space then. And then uh, later on, uh, you could, if you found a better place where you could move it, or maybe we could just leave it there. It might not be a problem. So, Councilor Barry, uh, I'd just like to ask about uh, liability. I think it's covered, but uh, uh, the liability of the school, and if someone got injured uh, flipping on the on the mm -hmm. skateboard, uh, would you talk about, about that a little bit? Okay. Well, uh, you direct I, that. Just everything that the town does that has liability for, including individuals attending this meeting this evening. But uh, we do have insurance that, that covers it within the Maine Tort Claims Act. But we do have liability, and we, we would need to be sure that it was appropriately built. And the students, uh, obviously, are working on the safeguards to ensure that. Thank you. And one more question. Is, uh, is there a, a standard uh, 
like you talk about an Olympic sized swimming pool or is there some national organization that has uh, standards for the construction of uh, the skateboard thing or do you just design your own? I'm not really sure about standards, but there is a really popular skateboarding, uh, skateboarding, I'm not sure what to call it, architecture company. Uh -huh. And it's called Ramp Tech. They work off of RampTech.com and they give you plans for ramps for certain sizes. And uh, so that the angles are right and stuff, so people won't get injured. Okay. And like they give you the type of wood to use, so it's safe and stuff. And okay. skateboarders can use pads and stuff. Thank you. Councilor Watson. Madam Chair, please excuse my voice because I've kind of lost it. But I want to commend you folks on taking the initiative <laughs> to do this project because that's what it takes to get this to happen. And that's what they did in the city of Portland, the students from the Portland Regional Vocational Center actually designed, I'm sure you're aware, you know, the actual ramps. Working with that design company, I think it's down in Wells or Gunkwood or Kennebunk or something. And, um, you know, to answer uh, Councillor Barry's question, they've designed them all over the state and in New England. In fact, this company, I believe, was responsible for designing the part of the park at the anti-gravity center that's just been built in Carabasset Valley. So, um, you know, I, I commend you and you know, wish you well. I, I, it's this kind of grassroots effort that it takes to, to get this off the ground and make it portable so it's movable. I think that you've addressed a lot of issues that are concerns for people. <clears throat> and I think it's wonderful that the um, high school administration is behind you and willing to give up a couple parking spaces to make this happen so you can do it in a safe place and um, congregate together. I think that's very important. So um, I'm uh, with our council uh, chair. I would be supportive of this contingent, of course, upon you know acceptance by the rest of the administration and, and the school board. And I commend you. Thank you. Councilor swift Kayata. I'd like to join Councilor Watson. I think this is a great idea. And I really, uh, on behalf of the town and the skateboarders in town, I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that basically you're doing this as your senior project, but at the end of the project, this, these ramps and whatever will become the property of either the town or the school department, right? And I mean, I know you guys are yeah. moving on to bigger and better things probably, but um, you will sort of are leaving this to the town or the school department so that then it will be someone else's decision as to where these are ultimately set up for future usage once school is back in session or during the summer. Is that right. correct? Yeah, and uh, okay. like you said, like for our project. And when our project is over, we'll, we'll, I mean, we get, it ends in like three weeks. Right. And, uh, we, I think it's safe to say it'll probably take more than that and we will be dedicated to, to go further until we feel it's finished. Great, well, I, I'm in support of this and I'd be happy to vote on it tonight if the rest of the council concur. Councilor McGinty, Likewise, sorry. I, th I think it's a great idea too and I, well, I can't say anything more than anybody else has said. Um, just contingent on uh, the school administration, the school board action. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that I like the idea of the musing. Recycled wood. From <laughs> <laughs> this is the queen of recycling over here. <laughs> the the demolition pile is always a concern to me. And uh, it <laughs> seems like there's a lot of good wood products there. <laughs> to use and it cuts down on the amount we pay to have somebody handle it in many cases so use as much um, as we can yeah um, and i also like the idea of going of your going out and and seeking money other than than the tax base for this that's it's a difficult issue at this point in well, time take some money from too. <laughs> I, I, I just just another comment that i i think you know i don't know whether you have kids that are in, the seniors and juniors and sophomores and kids coming up, but a lot of the way you um, conduct yourself there will have a lot to do with, I think, um, you know, continuing it. And, and I think, you know, so I wish you well with that. Yeah, we, we thought that might have been a problem, like, uh, like it might be a place where kids might hang out and maybe, like, it, it might be like a place where they hang out and do some bad things. Like, but when uh, Mr. Lee talked to Officer Gaspar, he, he looked at it more like a place where they'd go and not get in trouble. It'd just be a good place for them to go instead of doing other stuff. So that's the way we're looking at it. It just, <coughs> excuse me, 
I spoke with the chief of police about this as well, and he preferred that it be in the center of town because it is a spot that, in case there were any issues, that it was close by. And I think you know the location the students have chosen, uh, you know, is probably the most advantageous location in terms of if you look at the school property, it's the furthest away from any residential property that might might have some effects and. Uh, that's a very positive aspect of the proposal they've come forward with for the senior parking lot. The middle school parking lot that we had been talking about is close to some homes in Elizabeth Park. And as you get into some of the other parking areas, you get close to some homes on uh, Route 77. This particular area uh, is, uh, you know, a spot that if there is any noise uh, or, you know, sense of noise, that it's uh, quite a distance from other areas. Councilor McGinn. I'll make a motion if we are ready for that. I'm ready. Boys, you may stand or <laughs> you can sit, but I want to thank you very much for coming and for your complete report. And it's, I didn't really think we would be able to act on it tonight, but it looks like we are. you have anything you want to uh, add before yeah, we take it like, back? Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing. Uh, Wyndham High School and Freeport High School have done similar things. Like Their high school gave them an area and supported it. And uh, there's other towns like Old Orchard Beach that have sponsored their skate parks and they're coming up everywhere nowadays, and so I just figured it was a good idea. And, uh, Seems like the time's right. Yeah. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, if I could anticipate one, one problem um, that you may um, end up with tomorrow uh, from the viewers watching, and I'll try to head off any phone calls that may be coming to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are aware that at the high school right now, we do have competition for parking spaces down back in the pool area. Uh, I don't see this as uh, having a major impact on that area because different students park there. Uh, but um, we are sensitive to that and working on it. That's great. great. Thank you. It's always good to head them off at the turn. <laughs> I'll yeah. second John. It's been board. moved by John. All right, contingent on approval by the school board uh, in conjunction with the I'll school administration. That. It was seconded already by Councillor Watson. <laughs> Is there any more discussion on this issue? Councillor Fritz. Wondered, um, the, the letter that we got that explained it talked about being available only until sunset. Um, and I mm. think that maybe ought to be part of our approval. Well, I don't know. Let the school board handle I think yeah. maybe that's yeah. an issue that the school board should handle. I don't know that I'm not prepared to put that into the motion myself. I don't know about, I didn't make the motion, no, but. No, I think that uh, the whole who can control. be there, the whole control that would need to be worked out, I think, later. I think now we just property. need to get the, get the construction going, yes. get the process going. Councilor Barry. Yeah, I, I assume this is intramural. That is, uh, for the town of Cape Elizabeth, is not uh, in competition with other towns or uh, a team. <laughs> or, uh, not that kind of a thing. We're talking about local, right? I don't know. We always have pretty good teams here, you know. We I could know be that. competing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to us being in the Olympics for this. Uh, <laughs> I'm comfortable with the motion as it stands. I'm I leaving too. it with the school board. I, I support John's original motion. So do I. Yeah. Okay, we're going to call a question. All those in favor? Opposed, none. It's a heck of a deal. That's pretty speedy for us here. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for coming and making the presentation to us. And I'm, I'm glad that there was a, a location that's, um, that's out there so that we could act on it tonight and start collecting your wood right away. <laughs> OK, the next item, item number 85, report from the planning board on proposed amendments regarding nonconforming lots. Um, <laughs> I wondered what you, you guys were doing there. Yeah, right, right there. Are, we know sure. this, are you looking for this? Thank you. Looks like you'll have plenty of people there, that's for sure. Huh? Yeah. This is the upcoming generation. I think there's yeah. two ages here. All right, I'll read that again for the, for the watching uh, public on TV. Now, item number 85, report from the planning board on proposed amendments regarding non-conforming lots. Um, I wanted to just take a moment for those people that are watching at home and those people that are here, that this is certainly an issue that's been on our table and as well as on the planning board's table for at least 10 months and probably some previous years as well since it started uh, earlier than that. I also want the public to know that the council is pretty well informed on 
two points of view, at least, on this issue. And this is the material that we have received so far on this issue. And all the counselors have this packet. I hate to think of how many trees have gone down for us to get this packet of information. So um, we, we do have a, a lot of information about it. And <clears throat> we are prepared to get more. This is not a public hearing. Much of the information that has been uh, disseminated in a variety of ways, we've received emails, faxes, telephone calls, and personally addressed letters, which all the counselors have gotten. And if any individual counselor has gotten it, we have made copies so that other counselors, I think, have everything that there is. The council is particularly interested in those lots that are less than 20,000 square feet and more than 10,000 square feet. That seems to be where our focus is. The Planning Board has been working on this issue for quite some time. and. We as a council want to thank the planning board for the amount of time and effort and energy and learning curve that they have had to put in to deal with an issue that's as complicated as this. Um, it's just one more sign of the committees in this community who participate uh, and help the, the <coughs> council. But I want also to keep in mind that the planning board, like most of the boards and commissions in this community, are an advisory board. They spend the time, they do research, they get the information, they work with staff, and they get to have a public hearing. The Planning Board has, a, has had a public hearing on this issue. We have not had that yet. That is now report has been made by the Planning Board and has been sent to the Town Council, and it is now our time to act on it. The Council is the elected board, they are the decision-making board, and the policy board. So the Planning Board, in its capacity historically, has acted as an advisory board and have advised us and made recommendations uh, based on their information. And the next group to, to act on this will be the council. But I wanted to take a moment to say one of the pieces of information so that the public uh, that's watching on TV could see is the council has been uh, given a large map, uh, which we have here on a smaller form here. And I just wanted the um, TV camera to see this for a moment. and for the audience to see it, for those that are here. This is the map that we were presented with that showed us uh, most of the lots in question, those that are under 20 and those that are more than 10. Some of the information that, has, that, that I've received, and I think most of the council has received in, on letters and telephone calls, is this horrendous fear that the council is going to vote for something and huge tracts of open farmland and beautiful vistas is going to be built up on these tiny little lots. And I, I don't know, I can't speak for all the council, but I know that most of the council has been in their car with this map and with the list, and we have gone all over the town to look at these lots. And I just want to, so that they, because I don't think the TV camera can really see it all, that the lots are marked in red that are of interest to us on this issue. And we are up here, up by the, the headlight in the Delano Park area, this end of town, and there's a red mark here, two here, one here, two or three here. There's two or three over here on the Sawyer Road. Come down into Shore Acres. There are three or four there. There are five uh, in Broad Cove on Hunts Club Road, but I mean Hunts Point Road, except that this is a little different issue. These are merged lots. These already have houses on them. There's a few over here on uh, off Fowler Road. There's a couple on Fowler Road. Um, there's a few uh, on the, these are the, I guess this is Hunts Point, I don't have the right back. No, this is Hunts Point Road here. This is a grouping of several, but some of them already have houses that are, have merged two or three lots together and the houses are now in the middle. And um, over here there's one on Fesedin, just off Fesedin, I mean on Fesedin, near Fesedin. So there, I just want the, the, the viewing audience to see that there are no huge tracts of open farmland, but small individual infill lots that are already in subdivisions. And this is what the council has focused on. Uh, and I wanted you to see those sorts of things. Now also keep in mind when you're looking at this map that none of these lots are buildable if they don't pass the soils test. If they don't pass the soils test, we don't care what size it is. It's not going to be buildable if it can't support a septic system, if, this is, if they're in the unsewered area. Now, several of these that I looked at and went with some counsel, they look like, there's a couple that look like they're actually practically in 
great pond, they're so close. That's not likely to be able to be built on, because keep in mind we have a shoreland zoning and a wetland zoning ordinance too. So some of these will be eliminated when they're examined more or if people make uh, requests for them. Um, there's one here on, on Bayberry, you drive through that neighborhood, I didn't actually count the houses that are on that loop of Bayberry Road, but uh, there might be 12 or 14 houses and all those houses sit on about 15,400 and something square feet of land. The remaining lot there is also 15,480 square feet or whatever it is. So this is all those houses were built on the same size. This is one lot that does not have a house on it. That they want to know, those people want to know if that's still available. So these are the lots that we looked at. I think the council is going to focus, focus on two major things. This is as we saw it a year ago and we moved this issue to the planning board. Was a property right taken away from an owner of a lot? We'll focus on that. And number two, should the rights of that owner and other lot owners who also lost their rights be restored? Those are issues that we will have to focus on. And we will, of course, try to be fair and reasonable to all citizens. I have um, uh, a, a couple of things. I want to remind the public at home and the public here that this is not a public hearing. We have just gotten most of this information in the last couple of days. And well, not these letters, but, but some other information. So this is our usual procedure. Our usual procedure on an issue that comes to us from the planning board, they make a recommendation to us. We take that under advisement by giving it to our ordinance committee, which is made up of three councilors, who will also uh, work the issue over and report back to the full council for a decision. Instead of doing that in the interest of time, I have asked the council to sit as a whole. And that is, instead of three members sitting at our ordinance committee, the entire council will sit as a whole so that we don't have to keep repeating ourselves. Tonight, I have what I'd like to see happen is that we have uh, some comments to be made from the town attorney who has looked into the issue and uh, over the last few years and the present planning board decision. And he is going to make a, uh, a report. I'd like to ask Dave Griffin, who is chairman of the planning board, to make the report from the planning board as he gives it to the council, which would be a normal usual way of doing business. And again, remembering that this is not a public hearing, I would like to ask two reports be made. One from Mr. Vos, because he is the original petitioner to the planning board and the town council. His is one of several lots, but he is the original petitioner that brought this whole thing to us. And then I'd like to ask from somebody, I don't know who, but somebody from the space committee to speak on that other point of view that they have. Um, I also, each of those points of views is just a summary and it's a three minutes. This is not the time to make a long presentation. I, I know that probably you want to, but ordinarily we don't have anybody speak at these times. So this is a three minute presentation from each side, an opportunity to speak. We would like an opportunity to hear you and there will be several other opportunities to hear from all citizens, including those, those two people. We have set two workshop dates to work on this. I didn't, we forgot to bring my calendar, but we will be making a recommendation on those two workshop dates. The last Monday in April is the first one. Uh, does anyone have the two? Well, we'll do that when we bring it up, when we set those. We have um, the 30th and May 3rd, I believe. That's correct. The 30th of April and May 3rd are the two uh, workshop dates that we will have. Followed by that, follow those two meetings, will be a regular announced public hearing for everybody to have the opportunity to speak on the issue as they'd like. So now, um, given my little parameters here for the meeting, uh, I would ask the town attorney to make the, um, his presentation as a research. <coughs> yes, I, I also, I do want to make sure that, that this material, that you, that you see that this material is not staff material. This is almost all letters from people who have points of view on the issue, citizens just at large, and, and just, just general people. So 
that we have received all the letters and we thank the people who, or all of them, who have taken the time to write uh, to us about this issue. It certainly is an issue of interest to a lot of different people. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Michael Hill from Monaghan Leahy. Uh, I was asked to come tonight to give a brief historical overview of uh, where we were pre-1997, what happened with the 1997 zoning ordinance changes, and what uh, the result of the 1999 technical amendments were. And at, at the beginning, at the outset, I'd like to say not only do we have our local ordinance, but there's also the state minimum lot size statute. And the state law applies to all land located in the state of Maine. And then if the local municipality has a minimum lot size, that applies too. So if the local law, local ordinance is more restrictive than the state statute, local ordinance would prevail. But if the state statute uh, is more restrictive, that, that would govern. Our pre-1997 ordinance had uh, several different uh, aspects of it. It separated lots that were created prior to 1968, which was the last major zoning ordinance uh, in the town. Anything that, any law that was created after 1968 could be developed in accordance with the provisions that were applicable when that law was created. If it was created prior to 1968 and not in a subdivision, it would have to be merged uh, with other land in common ownership uh, to meet the uh, space and bulk requirements. <coughs> with certain minimum requirements that I'll, I'll talk about. Basically, the ones that we're most concerned about, the 10,000 if sewered and the 20,000 if not sewered. If a lot was created before 1968 and was shown on a lawfully recorded subdivision plan, the merger provisions would not apply. You'd still have to meet certain, certain minimum, minimum setback requirements and lot width requirements and also that 10,000 and 20,000 square foot applied. So all non-conforming lots had to have a minimum of 10,000 square feet if served by public sewer, 20,000 square feet if uh, served by a private septic system, or otherwise met the town's septic system ordinance found in Chapter 15, Article 2. Uh, and met the state minimum lot size statute. Now that statute has a 20,000 square foot minimum lot size requirement. It will allow exemptions for lots under 20,000 square feet if the Department of Human Services uh, granted a waiver. And they would, there's a whole volume of regulations that the DHS has. Yes? Excuse me, I'm sorry, but which year are you talking about? Because you're using the present tense, so. Well, which I'm sorry, the state minimum lot size still applies, so that's why I'm using the pres okay. present tense while describing this, but right now I'm talking about pre-97. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood. I'm sorry. Yep, no, I, it's confusing. <laughs> well, I guess used to judges anyway. <laughs> just a minute. So, uh, the Department of Human Services would review uh, soil types, how close you were to a well and a lake or a stream and so forth. So you, you could get a, minimum, uh, a, a waiver of the 20,000 square foot minimum lot size from uh, Department of Human Services. Um, DHS had a policy that they wouldn't go below 10,000, but my understanding is uh, it kind of depended on who you landed with at DHS as to whether they would grant anything below 10,000, but the, I think the party line, if you will, from the state is that they wouldn't grant it for a lot that was under 10,000 square feet. So anyway, that's where we were pre-97. And, and again, the state minimum lot size statute is still applicable today. Okay, the 97 changes. Uh, we added definition of a non-conforming lot. 
which was any lot which didn't meet current standards for lot size, net lot area per dwelling unit, street and free street frontage, but was lawful when created. Okay? We removed the distinction between lots created before 1968 uh, and those after. We only talked in terms of uh, prior to 1997. We, the words uh, otherwise meeting the requirements of section 1933, which is the local septic system ordinance, and the state minimum lot size statute were removed. So our office took the position that with that language removed from with the 1997 changes, the exception for a non sewered lot under 20,000 square feet was removed. You couldn't get uh, a building permit for a lot that was under 20,000 square feet uh, after 1997. There were other uh, minor changes with the non-conforming lot section in 1997, including setback requirements from roads. We added different road classifications and we included um, maximum lot coverage standards, 25% if public sewer, 20% if private. There was also a change to the phrase uh, about approved recorded subdivisions. The old pre-97 spoke in terms of um, lawfully recorded subdivisions. 1997 changed that to approved recorded subdivisions, this has, having to do with uh, the merger of lots. So lots that met the minimum lot size and were in an approved recorded subdivision weren't merged. Lots that were not in an approved recorded subdivision uh, could be required to be merged to meet space and bulk requirements. And I point that out because that pre-97 lawfully recorded subdivision, if you go back into the 1800s, anybody could basically record a subdivision plan. If you drew the lines, you could take that uh, into the registry and get it recorded. And so in 97, we added uh, approved recorded subdivision to give, you had to have some municipal review. So that, that would still include some subdivisions from the early 1900s, 1920s, let's say, where the subdivision had to go before the Board of Selectmen. There wasn't a lot of review process, but it did have some municipal approval. Okay. 1999, the technical amendments, uh, if you have it in front of you, what 1943, a1A, uh, there was a change adding to the first paragraph the words, as long as the requirements of the chart below are met. The final draft of the Zork committee had 1943A1 as one paragraph. And I'm not sure why, when it was finally adopted, it was separated out into two paragraphs. And it, it could lead one to the impression that the chart only applied to the lots that were referenced in the second paragraph. In other words, uh, if, if a lot could meet the setback requirements, uh, you, you know, a vacant lot, a proposed building could meet the setback requirements, one might have had the argument that there's no minimum lot size if you could meet the setback requirements. And we, our office had always read the 97 ordinance in a way that that chart applied to the, that whole subsection. Um, to remove that, any argument that that chart didn't apply to the entire subsection, we added as long as the requirements of the chart below are met to the end of the first paragraph. So there had always been an absolute minimum of 10,000 square feet for a sewered, in a public sewered lot 
prior to 1997. That, that didn't change with the 97 ordinance, nor did it change with the 99 technical amendments. There was always a minimum of 20,000 square feet for a privately uh, served septic system, uh, a lot with a privately, uh, private septic system prior to 1997. That continued to be the case in 1997 and with the 99 technical amendments. The 97 amendments, or uh, zone change, removed the exception for the state minimum lot size waiver, and the, the 99 technical amendment uh, was simply to clarify that the chart in 1943A1A applied to the entire subsection and, and not to um, just the second paragraph of that. Um, Nonconforming lots are, uh, and nonconforming uses for that matter, are, are really uh, thorny subjects, uh, and a lot of municipalities have difficulty uh, with these because somebody's property rights uh, are affected, will always be affected by these, uh, these sections in, in a municipal's ordinance. Someone that had a lot that was buildable in the late 60s, things changed, minimum lot size uh, increased, and um, the nonconformant sections in any municipality are meant to kind of soften that uh, blow to the property owner. But it's, it's always a thorny, thorny topic. Um, I've also provided the council with a, a letter outlining a few uh, options uh, going forward, some policy uh, things that you might want to consider. I'd be happy to go over that letter with you now if you'd like, or answer questions that anyone might have about the um, history, where we ended up. I'd rather do it at workshop, I think. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would prefer to review the letter before I... Yeah, we have not reviewed the sure. letter. We, we just we did just get the letter this. tonight. Right. So we, we have not yeah. reviewed that at all. Is it possible, to, it's helpful to the council, you sort of gave a, a, a nice chronology there. If you could just write that chronology down and provide us with that. Sure, yeah. That I'll, would be helpful to us I'll clean well. up my outline yeah, and... Just uh, fix up your notes a little bit so we can read them. <laughs> okay. And that would be helpful to us also as, as we do our deliberation. This is a good time. Are there any other questions that you wanted to? Um, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, pull together some of the things that you said. Now, the, the state minimum lot size waiver was in the 1997 ordinance, but when it came, it was removed when? It was removed in 97. Yeah, okay. But, but the state still has a minimum lot size statute. Yes. So all communities in Maine must have to assume that whatever they write for ordinance, that that's, the state still has its statute Correct. up there. Correct, right. So... We're stricter. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you still have to know it's up there. You have to be aware of it. Removing the... Uh, reference to the state minimum lot size statute also removed a reference to the uh, waiver provisions that are found within it. Right. So um, having to do, you know, with lots that aren't in, in, the, in the shoreland zone, and that's another mm -hmm. uh, topic. But um, uh, our ordinance became more restrictive by removing that language because it removed the ability to get the waiver. Now, it just stated our minimum lot size for private septic is 20,000 square feet, period. It didn't go on to say, or if you can otherwise meet the state minimum lot size statute. So, so the, our position is the change occurred in 97 with the removal of that language. Madam Chairwoman. Okay, yes, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, Mr. Hill, the, uh, that language was obviously was inadvertently left out, but it's still there in one of the other sections, is it not, if you're in the shoreland or something? It, yes, it, it's still in the nonconformance uh, section if you're within the shoreland zone. That section uh, followed uh, the uh, suggested language uh, for the, when the, when the shoreland zoning came into effect, that was the language that was uh, presented by the state to meet their uh, shoreland zoning requirements. So any change in that nonconformance section would have to be uh, sent up to Augusta for 
approval to make sure that it was at least as stringent as the uh, uh, state guidelines for, for the shoreland zone. So we're so currently we, more restrictive inland as opposed to being next to the water? Uh, in, the sense that, in the sense that the uh, state minimum lot size waiver could still be uh, obtained in the shoreland zone and not in inland, yes. So it's available so. in the shoreland. It could be available the, the, as an option. The waiver the shoreland could be. zone, yes. but it's not in the, right. the inland RA right. zone. Okay. Thank was, you. was that on purpose? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know whether, I really don't know whether the, mm. that removal of those words was intentional or not. Mm. I wasn't involved with the Zork. Um, I didn't go to all the Zork meetings, and I'm, I'm just not, I'm just not sure. I went through my, I have a, you know, a file about that thick from the Zork committee, uh, but I didn't go to all those meetings, and I couldn't find any notes in my records from att attending a meeting t uh, when this topic came up. So I really, I just don't know whether it was intentional or not. I, I, I that's where we are. The, <laughs> the, the viewing public that Zork stands <laughs> yeah. for Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Committee, which was a committee that went over all the ordinances in the town right. and is made up of citizens, planning board members, zoning board members, councilors, had several, right. several people. It was a fairly large committee. So the entire zoning ordinance, I've right. read that properly. And, and it was uh, picking out the nonconforming, uh, the sections that dealt with nonconformance from the old pre-97 ordinance and trying to put them all into uh, one spot. So it is possible that that phrase was inadvertently admitted. I, I just don't know. Mm. Okay. Council Watson. Madam Chair, I just want to clarify something. It seems to me that prior to 97, there always was um, recourse in the event a property owner's land didn't meet the town of Cape Elizabeth's requirement. They had recourse back to the state. Is that correct in terms of minimum lot size exemptions and right. grandfathering? Is, is yes. that my understanding? Yes, they, they could apply for the waiver. They'd have to meet all those sure. DHS regulations, but yes, they'd have that available to them. And But as a result of whatever took place for whatever reason in 97, that was deleted or left out of the section for lots with the exception of shoreland zoning, which typically by the state of Maine have always been more restrictive. Right. And yet those lots have that same ability for exemption and grandfathering. Is that correct? That's right. So what we now have are two standards, if you will, within this ordinance yeah. that don't seem to um, jive. jive. Absolutely. And that's, I think, why we have a problem. Right. I want to just make sure that I've got this yeah, that, laid out correctly. That, I, I believe you do. All right, thank you. <laughs> questions by counselors. Any more questions before we proceed? Mike, thank you very much for that summary of events. Sure. And, uh, and you will try and get it in writing so that we can add that to our packet okay. of information. Okay. And um, I, I'm not sure. We, we are not, as I say, this is not a public hearing. We have no intention of asking a lot of questions that require any debate between us and whoever's standing there, but we'd be happy to have you stay a little. Okay, sure, be happy to. Thank you. Yeah, now um, I'd like to ask David Griffin to come <coughs> and, and because we have the proposal as brought to us by the planning board and he is going to speak to that for us. He is the chairman of the planning board, the new chairman of the planning board, is that right? Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, fellow councilors. <coughs> My name is Dave Griffin, Chairman of the Planning Board, and I understand that you have received our report. I truly regret that it took us so long to address and complete that project, <laughs> but I would like to take a few moments to explain the process we took and how it unraveled. <clears throat> we requested from the town planner a list of, uh, let's back up here a little bit. I would like to, at first, uh, make you aware of uh, the complexity of the issue as we began our discussions. We soon realized that there were potentially uh, many property owners in the same position as the original petitioner, and that we should 
do some research to try and establish an inventory of similar lots. We requested the uh, town planner to provide us with a list of building lots under 20,000 square feet and over 10,000 in sewered and unsewered. Keep in mind that this first list was far from complete. In our further discussions, we felt in order to get close to an actual count, the town planner and her staff would require more research and time to put this together. Maureen O'Meara and her staff undertook the responsibility to do some research at the Registry of Deeds. This resulted in a more complete list. Not totally complete, but at least closer to a real number. We subsequently had several meetings where we discussed the project and finally prepared a motion. <clears throat> a hearing for the subject took place on March 20th at our regular scheduled meeting, following which a vote was taken. The result was four to three, recommending that the minimum lot size for the non-sewered lots be maintained at 20,000 square feet. I have further, a couple further comments. We had two new board members join us this past year at the end of 2000, and I think it was important for us to give them time to get up to speed on the project before we asked them to vote. The second comment I'd like to make is, in the future, as a board member, I would recommend that when policy issues are brought before the board, that a workshop be held with the Planning Board and Town Council. It would help us to better understand your requests of us, and it would <coughs> enhance your knowledge of the subject. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak. And as chairman and representative of the planning board, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, wait just a second, just in case anybody has any direct questions about the process or anything. Does not. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the amount of time that was put in, because I, I, I know we wanted it back in a hurry. And I know that you got into some research. And I know the staff had to work hard to provide you with the information that you wanted. But uh, we're glad to have the report now, and we're glad to get on with this, and, and you guys did a great job and a lot of hard work, and I appreciate it. I speak for the whole council. Um, now, I would like to ask somebody from space, I don't know who is here, and somebody to speak from space and see if they could uh, give us a summary. Just give us your name and where you live for the record, and give us a summary, a three-minute summary, <laughs> which I know is difficult. This isn't, but you'll have another opportunity. Okay. <laughs> My name is Marguerite Prentice, and I live at 18 Ocean Avenue. Um, first, I would like to say that um, in my research, when I began this um, whole project, um, it looked to me like the ordinance was clearly written. And furthermore, it was consistently enforced since 1997. Um, I looked up other cases to find out, you know, how the town had, um, what, what the town decided about building on undersized lots. And it, they were all consistent in, according to this 20,000 square foot minimum for lots needing septic systems. Um, I know that um, there's been a lot of conversation about intent, um, but I think that instead of trying to unravel what happened. Um, it's my hope that you will consider the ordinance and um, the value that it has for the town right now, today. Um, personally, I believe that that 20,000 foot standard is a good standard. I think it um, protects the environment and um, it protects these existing neighborhoods where septic systems are located on undersized lots. In my neighborhood alone, across the street from me is an 8,000 square foot lot. 
Next door is a 5,000 square foot lot. Next door to that is a 5,000 square foot lot. Across the street is, well, I don't, I don't know exactly that size, but the lot in question on Ocean Avenue is a 10,000 square foot lot, and mine is an 8,000 square foot lot, and on the other side of that lot, it's under 10,000 square feet. I mean, this kind of neighborhood would never be designed today because it just doesn't meet environmental standards. Um, and also, I wanted to point out that, um, again, please verify this with Jay Hardcastle down at the Department of Health Engineering. Um, the Department of Health Engineering does give septic system waivers for lots under 20,000 square feet, but they do not look at neighborhood density for an already existing lot. They do look at density if it's a big subdivision plan that they're reviewing for septic systems, but they do not look at it for an existing neighborhood. And secondly, they have no jurisdiction over groundwater quality, and they don't test the groundwater. So they don't really know if there's a nitrogen contamination. Now, there's a lot of talk about how um, the soil is very good for septic systems in our neighborhood, but it is a coarse, sandy soil which encourages the migration of nitrogen into groundwater. So in that sense, they're not good soils. Um, and just to clarify a point earlier, um, in our town ordinance, we do not give waivers at all, period, on minimum lot size. But the state obviously does give a waiver. But then again, the person that's giving the waiver doesn't look at density and doesn't look at groundwater quality. Um, I think that this 20,000 minimum does, it, it keeps the situation in these neighborhoods from getting worse. Thank you, um, Mrs. Prentice. You're three minutes. Is it up? Okay. It is. It is. Can I make one more comment okay. about dangerous precedent? I think that if you allow the building on these small lots, then you have to look at the other 61 lots that are on sewer. So, okay. please, don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Vos, who was the original petitioner, to speak, please, if you'd like. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'm Paul Vos, uh, 21 Linwood Street. I'm uh, not exactly prepared to speak tonight. I didn't know that, that I would have this opportunity, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Um, I guess in direct contrast to the speaker before me, I, I would very much appreciate it if you would unravel um, the situation that has happened in our town. Um, I believe that people's rights were taken from them very unintentionally, but nonetheless taken from them without any notice. And it's created extreme hardship of many kinds for those people, and I am one of those people. I, I feel fortunate that I found out about this problem when I did, and that I'm in a position to bring it before you, and that there are still people, um, that the, the people who participated in this process are still available to me, and interested in the process that they work so hard on to let their voices be heard about what their intentions were and what they discussed and what they didn't discuss and what they meant for our town when they rewrote the ordinance. I don't have a lot of time, so I guess I'd like to just ask you to consider very carefully the document, which I don't have the correct title of, but it's um, dated May 15th, I believe, of 2000, and it's uh, created by the town and it was an overview and comparison of the zo new zoning ordinance to the previous one and it was a working document that was used at a public forum for people to um, hear about what the new ordinance was to mean and it was distributed to the public I have reviewed all of the videotapes all of the audio tapes I've read every document that I can get my hands on that are public record and in that document yes it does say that the shoreland zone was supposed to be formatted directly over um, to the new ordinance with minor editing because it had recently been re reworked. And it does say that the nonconformance outside of the shoreland zone was <laughs> found in many sections and had been put into a new format. And then it listed what the changes were. Nowhere did it say anything about removing the minimum lot size waiver from our ordinance. 
But that's not the final resting place for me because I've gone and talked to every person who will speak with me who was on the, on the council or who was a member of Zork and said, did you intend to do this? Did you discuss doing this? And they said, no. We absolutely did not intend to take anyone's property rights away without letting them know about it. I'm one of those people who would have known about it. In fact, I had just purchased my lot and I was watching very carefully to see what the new ordinance was. I supplied you with a Cape Courier article recently that I highlighted that showed where it said, come in, review the draft with the code enforcement officer for your specific property to make sure that your questions about your specific property are addressed. I did that. On two separate occasions I did that because at that time we had two different code officers and I made a point of speaking to both of them. They both assured me my property remained buildable under the new ordinance in 1997. I'm not a lawyer. I, I do have some understanding of ordinances. I'm, I'm not, you know, they don't overwhelm me, but at the same time I didn't read the entire document to say, well, are there any other problems here that I should be aware of that may later come back to affect me personally? What I did read and what I was shown made sense to me. And before you added the 11 words, as long as the requirements of the chart below are met, I was told specifically my lot remained buildable by those, that paragraph in conjunction with the plumbing code, which was the town's plumbing code, which is the state plumbing code, which allows for the minimum lot size waiver. Now, recently I discovered the shoreland zone allows for the minimum lot size waiver, as Mr. Hill discussed tonight. I can't think of a better demonstration that a problem exists, because if you were going to take some rights away and not other people's rights away, I'm sure, not you, but the council that preceded you would have let people like me know about it. At least you would have had an article in the Cape Courier. Your three, three minutes, minutes are up. and 15 seconds is <laughs> Thank you very much. Just yes. I might, one question, yeah. Mr. Bose. You said a memo dated May 15, 15 2000. Uh, did you misstate the date? Uh, excuse me, I did, and I appreciate your, um, oh. uh, it was 1996. Oh, May 15, 1996? Yes, and it was, it was the, it was the um, document which discussed the pre-1997 existing town ordinances to what was being proposed to be passed. This was the last oh, public yeah. forum before it went to public hearing, as I understood from watching that video. And it is in the council. I think we have yes. that, actually. I remember, I read, yeah. remember reading we do. that one. It's in there. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and um, you will have other opportunities because we will be in public hearing. Now, the council, uh, first of all, is, I, again, I will reiterate, we are going to set two public hearing dates, and I guess you gave me the Workshop dates, but I date. forgot. Workshop dates. It was April 30th and May 3rd. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So where's my agenda here now? All right. Will we... Uh, yep. Point of information. We're, our job is to refer this to the workshop now. Yes. Madam Chair. Will there be a moment for discussion after the motion? Or if yes. Have oh, yes. Okay. Yep. Madam yes. Chairman, uh, point of order here. Shouldn't we receive the report from the planning board as part of the minutes of the meeting? Yes. All right. I would move that we do that. We're going to do two things. We're going to receive the report and we're going to refer it to public, to uh, workshop. Workshop. Uh, I <laughs> move that we receive the uh, report from the planning board. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept and receive the report from the planning board. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, none. I'll entertain a motion now to set this to workshop. All right, I'll, I'll move that we set the uh, matter for uh, workshop on April 30th and on May 3rd. I'll second. Uh, we are setting two workshops. We may complete it in one. So we, we are setting two workshop on dates. On May 30th, and if needed, then Thank you. on May 3rd. Uh, we may have other items, too. The second still holds. It's been moved and seconded to set this issue, as well as other issues will be coming up, I suppose, uh, to workshop on April 30th and May 3rd. All those in favor? Can we have some Any more discussion? Sorry. Any more discussion? <laughs> um, Councilor swift <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, I have no real questions, but I just have a brief comment. I just would like to uh, reiterate everyone's thanks to the planning board because I know they struggled mightily with this as did the planner and a number of other people. I want to thank everyone from the public who has contacted me and I presume all the other counselors by mail, by email, by phone, on, in the IGA, you know, wherever. Um, I think 
in Cape Elizabeth, we have a couple of very important shared values. First of all, I think we value open space and control of excessive development. If you read the newspaper this morning, the, uh, not the Courier, but the Press Herald, you can see that Cape has done a good job of controlling development. Um, as witnessed by our census data, in the last 10 years, Cape grew only 2.4%, or I think it's 214 people. So I think that's important that, that we've done that, and I think that's something that's been important to many people in this town. But I think we also have another shared value that's very important, and that's that we um, value our tradition of fairness and listening and equity. And uh, I'm committed, as I'm sure um, everyone else on the council is committed, to listening to everyone's point of view, to focus on facts. Uh, what, if we focus on facts, I think we will have a much better uh, chance of coming out with an equitable fair dis conclusion on this issue. And lastly, um, I would like to reiterate for anyone out either in the audience here or out in the TV viewers that um, this map that is over on the uh, left-hand side of the bulletin board over there shows unsewered lots between 10 and 20,000 square feet in size. And what that shows, I, I'm sure that's available to the public if anybody wants to come up to the planner's office to, to look at it. Uh, some people may have concern that there are hundreds and hundreds of lots in town that uh, we're, we're discussing in this matter. And after my having reviewed this map um, this afternoon with the town planner, I can see that we are talking about lots that amount to uh, less than two-tenths of one percent of the total acreage in town. We are really talking about very few lots, and that's it. those are all the lots that could conceivably be built on um, between in that category. Uh, some of them may not pass soils tests. I don't know. That would be a matter for those individual lots. But there, there has been a lot of, um, from the emails I've gotten, I can see that there's been a lot of people who have uh, received inaccurate information or who have not got all the facts on this situation. And I think it's contributed to, to a lot of people being very afraid of what will happen. And I just wanted to let you know, I think the council will consider the matter fairly and consider the magnitude of the problem for, for all residents of Cape Elizabeth, both the ones who are personally involved and then everyone else. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, I just wanted to know that I too take this matter seriously. I've been reading all of the material, getting the emails and the calls like everyone else. I have driven around now twice to look at every individual lot that is on that map, many of which cannot be built. Uh, there's one across the street from me that's literally in Great Pond. Um, but I will continue to do the research, try to keep an open mind. I am very pleased to see this map here tonight. Uh, thank Maureen for putting that together. I was getting inundated with calls from people who thought we were going to be uh, putting all of the lots in Cape Elizabeth on a 10,000 10, square foot basis. Uh, once we explained that it's just a limited number of ones in Maxwell's Field and Jordan's <coughs> Farm are not going to be carved up into 10,000 square foot lots, uh, they've backed down immediately. They, they had no idea that that was what the situation that we were talking about. And so for that, I'm glad we can take it to the workshop, and I hope we can get it back out and resolved very quickly. That's the intent. Councilor McGinty. Madam Chair, I'm in the unique position. I'm the only councilor who was, <laughs> has been here since I was on the Zork Committee. I was the chairman of the Ordinance Committee for the Technical Amendments, and I'm here now. I had the opportunity, like Mr. Hill, to be able to go through all my minutes, spent the better part of this afternoon doing that from the Zork um, Committee. Um, so I think I have unique insight into, um, you know, I was there. I know what was said, what wasn't said. Um, and um, I'm glad that we're going to have the opportunity to discuss this in workshops so um, everybody can get the insight from uh, what actually happened at the meetings and what was said or not said and what our intentions were or were not, um, depending how you look at it. Um, I'm up for re-election. Re I only hope that I'm still around to be able to take, uh, <laughs> take action on this when it comes up. So hopefully that will happen. We're counting on your organized sets of notes and minutes that I know you have. <laughs> They're in a big box. You can have them. <laughs> no, we're counting on you to report it to us. 
They, yes, Councillor Fritz. Yeah, I, I just have to echo, you know, what some other councillors have said about all the work that's gone into it. And, and I mean, I attended planning board hearing the other night and, and went around and looked at the lots. And, um, and I think there are still some, some things that we really need to analyze here. Um, because the planning board is making some suggestions of change, not just for this, but a few other um, implications of change, which sound a little bit familiar to the old, old ordinance that um, I used when I was on the planning board. Um, so I'm not sure there haven't been some other changes. Um, I, I'd also like to look into how people were assessed on these lots that were buildable or, or considered not buildable and whether there were any differences. I, I think that was mentioned in some of the workshops. So um, I, th I think we have some considerable looking and evaluating to do at the workshops. Any more comments? No more comments? Uh, I have one. Um, there are extra copies of Mr. Hill's letter outlining the alternatives that as soon as this item is made, they need to come up and grab it. There are no more comments. We're ready to, to vote on sending this to the workshop. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Item number 86, report from the town engineer regarding Fowler Road reclamation. I guess we'll wait a second <laughs> until <laughs> the until quiet here. Part two of the audience leaves. <laughs> right. Thanks for the water. <laughs> Donuts. Donuts, we may have to take a break. <laughs> okay, <laughs> item number 86, report from the town engineer regarding the Fowler Road reclamation. I'd like to ask Steve Harding to come and give us a little outline of the project. We drove a lot. All of us drove a lot on Fowler <laughs> Road while we were checking all of these yes. different lots. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I'm Steve Harding. I'm the town engineer. I work for OST Associates. I also have with me tonight uh, Bob Malley, the public works director. Um, so if you have any questions, hopefully Bob or myself can give you an answer. Uh, basically, to give you a little background on the project, uh, the scope of the project is uh, all the way from 77 to 77. Basically, we're going to go all the way from Ocean House Road over to Bowery Beach Road. Um, originally, MDOT looked at the project. They had suggested a, a full reconstruction project, which would have uh, re resulted in a project budget of about $2.5 million, of which, if you did the, uh, the math for the local split, would have been over half a million dollars uh, in local share. The council at that time, it's my understanding that they, they reviewed that and decided that that was more than what they wanted to spend on the road reconstruction, and that uh, they went back to PACS, and currently the project's budgeted at about 160, uh, excuse me, $640,000, our local cost of around $160,000. Uh, because there is uh, federal monies involved, uh, the MDOT will be required to review the project and the design and the work scope and the construction of the project, uh, which it will be a locally administered project so that uh, Bob Malley and uh, OST will actually uh, go through that process. Uh, the DOT will review that to make sure that the federal highway standards are being applied. Uh, that means uh, different requirements for the federal wage rates uh, being met, uh, uh, designated uh, disadvantaged businesses and women businesses rates being met, that it's a met metric project, and those kind of uh, things. We did meet with the MDOT in March to review the, the project and get uh, kind of their preliminary blessing on the scope, uh, and we're hoping to come to you uh, to talk about the scope and also uh, get you folks uh, on, board, on board with the project. Basically, the, what we're proposing to do is uh, reclaim the existing pavement that is grinded up, uh, regrade re the surface so that it uh, will drain properly, and repave the entire road to a four-inch depth um, to its current width. Included in that, we'll be doing some isolated drainage improvements to hopefully uh, improve uh, known drainage problem areas. Uh, one area that we're looking at is the Jewett Road area. We're thinking that we can do some improvements in that area and, and take the drainage down Jewett Road uh, to discharge an existing drainage system. 
Uh, we may need to also upgrade the Jewett Road system to accomplish that. Um, we'll be also working with the MDOT Environmental Department to make sure that any discharge into the Great Pond meets the environmental standards. Uh, so we're anticipating we may need to do an oil water separator or some kind of a discharge uh, enhancement system there. Uh, we're also going to be doing isolated drainage improvements throughout the road um, and trying to make the, the project and the base material in the road drain better um, to give the, the, the pavement surface a longer lasting life. Uh, we're not anticipating doing any curbing, uh, pedestrian walkways or bikeways at this time. Uh, there's several uh, constraints with the road in itself. Uh, the right-of-way varies from 30 to 50 feet. There's also utility conflicts, uh, which would make that uh, part of the uh, project very difficult to accomplish. The houses are very close to the road, and it would require taking a property to, to put in a sidewalk or a, a bikeway. Um, the utility upgrades, there's no sewer or underground um, gas, uh, natural gas in the road. Uh, we will be contacting the utility, uh, the Portland Water District, and the uh, cable and tele, uh, excuse me, electrical people and the telephone people. There may be some utility pole relocation, which we anticipate the utilities would undertake on their own expense. Uh, but we expect those to be limited and uh, may not actually have to occur. Um, the schedule for the project, we're hoping to uh, get your blessing to proceed, and we're going to try to get that prepared for a um, bidding date in late August of this year. Uh, we'd like to get that project, the project up and running and uh, make that happen. Uh, in order to do so, we'll need to coordinate our efforts with the DOT and hopefully get a timely review of um, our design plans and our uh, specifications from them. And uh, we're hoping at a minimum to get the base coat of pavement down and uh, possibly if we need to do the surface coat next year. Um, and that's basically a summary of the project scope and, and what we're planning to do. If anybody has any specific questions, we'd be pleased to try to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Barry. Um, will you have to uh, stop traffic at any point during the course of the construction? Traffic control is going to be an important feature. Uh, it's a pretty heavily um, run route. Right. I don't think that we would ever stop um, traffic entirely through that section. We'd want to at least keep one lane open for one emergency lane. vehicles. Thank you. Up to, people could get held up up to five minutes or so while you're doing cross. That's true. But, but we would... Have the option of going the other way. That that's true somebody, also. Yeah. I mean, we'd obviously try to coordinate that stuff and get information on the website as to what, what's going right. on particular days. Councilor McGinty. Um, <clears throat> the memo says uh, on page three, project schedule designed to be constructed during the 2001 construction season. We're pushing that back to... No, actually, we, we are trying to do it within the 2001 um, season. The only thing that may be set back would be the surface coating of the pavement. We, we, we may just put the base coat the top, down. The four, the four inch top. Uh, of the four inches, we would probably put down two and a half inches this and year. Go back to next year. And next year and surface the, do the, the surface coat. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Yeah, that was one of my questions on the timing. You see, if you're not going to bid it until August, you're really pushing the uh, it's a very window of screen. opportunity there. Um, on your project understanding, you've listed that Fowler Road is m more than a mile of roadway. Well, it should read. It's, it's just shy of two miles. Yeah, it's 1.9. You haven't understood the rest of it all the way along. And Bob probably can anticipate this question, but Fowler Road currently, between the paved surface and the, and the off-road, in many places drops off four to six inches. Will there be backfill in there so a person walking along that road after it's completed will not be turning their ankle if they're trying to walk? We would definitely try to enhance the shoulders as part of the effort. We're anticipating that we're going to have some excess material as we uh, grind the pavement up, and that's always a, a difficult problem is where do you get rid of that material, and the shoulders are an excellent spot for that to happen. So, yes, to answer your question, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be watching. <laughs> Carol, uh, Councilor Fritz. I just had a couple of questions about, and now that brings up another one. Um, in terms of having some extra paving on the side of the road, notice Bill Jordan's out here. I have to, I promised him some time ago I'd look to try and get roads widened a small amount on each side. Um, but I mean, this is, how, how wide is the pavement now? Pavement, as I understand it, is about 22 feet wide, um, two 11 foot travel lanes. Right. Okay. Um, 
And because this is federal funding, we wouldn't put in wide bikeways. But shoulders. you can't. Uh, sh shoulders. Well, I'm really talking. I'm talking having the ability to put, instead of a full bikeway, whether we have any flexibility to put two feet on, you know, expand it four feet, two feet on each side, and mark a line. And we what? may be able to do something like that. Um, we obviously wouldn't, to get back into like the two lights projects, the reason that we got that money initially was to put in a bikeway. And under that funding program, my understanding, it had to be built to their standards. The problem with making it wider, there's, there's a, it's going to be a very tight budget to do what we want to do anyway. If you make it wider, that's just increasing the amount of money that you're putting into the pavement. And we would need to go underneath the, where you extended the road, we would need to build up that base material. So you, you're starting to creep beyond the scope of the project, and also you're making the, the construction more difficult. And in doing that, you're going to add construction dollars. So it's not. You can't just say, well, it's 22 feet, and we're going to add two feet on both sides. It's, you know, 10 percent, so that's going to increase the paving 10 percent. It doesn't work that way. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's something higher than that. So. I mean, do we have any idea how much more, and would we get the same percentage federal match, do you think? If we went, my understanding, and Mike, you may correct me if I'm wrong, if we go over the budgeted amount, the DOT and the federal highways will expect a local um, municipality to basically cover that over amount. So if so anything over anything over is 100% funded by the municipality. We did just get the DEP to increase the overall budget from 600 to 640, uh, just as a, a contingency. I mean, I'm also wondering. <coughs> um, I mean, I recognize that you'd have to build up and on the sides of the roads, and it, and it isn't that easy, um, and it would be a lot more. But say problem areas in the road, like the very tight curve, mm -hmm. uh, whether that could have some extra pavement that would allow pedestrians or bikers to get off at that point when the visibility isn't so good. We can look into that. The problem with doing that, and there's, it's a very tight right of way. You only have 30 feet there. Is it 30 feet at that curve? Is that the narrow? I believe curve? so. I believe it's 30 feet there. It's about 30 feet. So that would also cause us a problem. We were talking with the school um, about buses and things, that if we could put sidewalks to Jewett. And so that wouldn't really, that wouldn't be a possibility because we don't have a right of way. Bob, if you're going to speak, you need to come to the microphone. <laughs> you'd be looking at right of way acquisition, I do believe, you know, to put sidewalks in. And then you'd have utility conflicts with the poles and fire hydrants. So it'd be quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. We still have questions for either one of you, so uh, yes, Councilor swift <coughs> Um You said that uh, the road is currently about 22 feet paved across, is that? That's correct. And what will it, will it still be 22 feet? That would be our intention to pave it to its uh, current width. So I, I certainly concur that it would be with uh, Councilor Fritz that it would be nicer to have it wider on, and even aside from the right-of-way problems, however, I think that the problem is money. Um, because if, if we start adding on, if it adds 20% or 30%, I don't know how much it would add, but 20 or 30% to put that on, I think you'd end up with, instead of just under two miles of road, you might end up with one mile of road that's wider, even if you could do it. So I think to get the full length, we, I think we just don't have the money. And I'm, we'll hear in a few minutes how it's a tough budget year. but. That's a difficult Robert. situation. Sorry. Steve, this is a connector road. What is the width generally of connector roads everywhere else? Because we have a lot of buses. We have all of the uh, heavy equipment coming out of Murray's Pit, uh, transport vehicles that are going across town. And that road is too narrow right now, and you cannot get out of the way. It, wouldn't it generally be 12 foot per travel lane in most, on most connector roads? And shouldn't we do this right and would, find the money somehow? It would be at least that. I mean, we have some sub minor subdivision roads that are 24 feet. So, I mean, I think under the classification, it could be 28, 30. So, and again, cost implications, right-of-way acquisition. 
We've been Mr. trying Finn to put back <clears throat> things the way they are to avoid takings and to avoid uh, right-of-way issues and property issues. But by, by takings, you mean right taking away. people's right. property. But you said you had 30 feet, so two well, I'm not sure exactly what the are, table is, but I, if you looked at paid. the standards for what a collector road should be, it's much more than 23. One of the issues we ran across in looking at this, as Steve mentioned at the beginning, that we were looking at a total reconstruction, the budget of which at one point was what, 2.5 2 million. 2.5 million, so with inflation, probably 3 million. And the difficulty is with that, if we had applied to tax for that, the way their funding formula works, they do a cost-benefit ratio per lane mile, and we would not have gotten any funding to do anything on the road. Uh, so the compromise was to go for the reclamation, uh, where we'd probably become eligible for the 80-20, uh, even though we wouldn't be able to accomplish as much. Uh, you may recall that this issue first came to the Council, I think, three years ago, and the citizens on Fowler Road were extremely upset at the condition of the road. And uh, we did some surveys, and they actually did show that the, the folks on Fowler Road would like a wider road. Uh, but you know, with the other budgetary issues the, the town is facing, you know, we were looking, the way it was turning out, we were looking at doing a, a 600 odd thousand dollar project that was going to be 80 percent funded by the federal government, about 150, 160 by the town, or we were looking at a two and a half to three million dollar project, 100 percent funded by the town. And that was the dilemma we faced, and you know, we've had a couple of meetings at the staff level, uh, Bob and Steve, and Steve has, you know, quite frankly, was a strong advocate to go in and, and do it and do all the reconstruction, put in all the drainage, take care of it. Bob shared that view, and uh, you know, particularly the council had expressed, uh, you know, as a matter of a statement of policy at one point, that you wanted these wider shoulders on these roads, mm -hmm. but to be paved. To uh, pay for bikes, yeah. You know, and Fowler Road shoulders. was mentioned. There were a couple of other mentioned, but we're quite frankly looking at. You know, a difference of 150 to 60,000 in town cost versus three million in town cost, and that—that uh, that was the dilemma. And I, uh, and this I took was the because more conservative approach. That was because of the the traffic on the road, the amount of traffic that would make us ineligible for that. No, it's when PAX looks at their funding formula, they look at many different issues. One of which, uh, several, one of which is the cost-benefit ratio of what you do, what your, your, your cost is per lane mile, and you know, then they look at the traffic volumes and everything else. The way it would have come out of the funding formula is we would have got knocked off the list. The other issue is there's only in that funding formula program, there's about six million available in each biennium that includes Portland, South Portland, Westbrook, Gorham, uh, a portion of Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, portions of Scarborough. Uh, and you know, when you look at the problems in Gorham and the places where there's, you know, growth of 34 percent in communities versus where there's growth in 2.4 percent, you know, we're very fortunate to get any money these days through the PACS process. And, uh, you know, they, they have a committee now doing a, a big study of that whole issue. And, you know, the, probably the end result of it will be is Cape Elizabeth leaving PACS because of the growth in Cape Elizabeth versus the other places is we're just not going to be able to compete for any funding. And, you know, this is the last hurrah, so to speak, as well as, you know, the other good news is MDOT, uh, if I might mm -hmm. off, is, you know, we're still working with them that they are coming up with money through MDOT primarily to pave 77 from the South Portland line out to Fowler Road. So, you know, the good news is those that travel Fowler Road will have a smooth paved surface all the way from South Portland to uh, the Sprague Hall. Speed bumps, actually. Yes. No, I, I agree. I, you know, I believe in wider roads, and I've built some that have been heavily criticized in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Sawyer Road, do you remember that? Fickett Street. Uh, Sawyer Road and Fickett Street. I want it narrow. Which everyone knows we're a disaster. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, you know, I'd love to be able to do a wider road there, and I'd love to be able to have wider roads in Cross Hill and some other neighborhoods, but uh, that'll be a, a debate for another evening. But this is this is quite frankly, financially driven. If additional money could be found somewhere, is there a possibility that the road could be built in such a way that you could do 12 feet? My driveway is narrow and it's 12 feet wide. I'm looking at it and I get on a, an 11 foot travel lane in, on, in the major road. And that just doesn't seem to make any sense to me to put that kind of money into a reconstruction 
and have it still be an 11 foot travel lane. I'm, I'm having a hard time buying that. Yeah, we, I understand that, Councillor Roberts, but you know, the, the possibility of finding additional money right now, <laughs> you know, unless you wanted to borrow it, uh, and I wouldn't recommend that because of, mm -hmm. you know, some of our other debt management policies that I was reminded of the other evening. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I think a lot of folks share your desire to have it wider, but mm. we, this, the road needs to be squeezed as just as the budget's being squeezed. Councillor Watson. Madam Chair, um, a question I have re is regarding Jewett Road. You mentioned there's going to be some new drainage, and a concern that I have is have you spoken to the residents of Jewett Road and do we expect any additional runoff kinds of issues that might impact their values be less. By, by doing the drainage, or will it be less? Do you know, what, it, what is going to be the impact for the property owners on Jewett? What we're anticipating is that there's already an existing drainage system in Jewett Road. Uh, we would be tying some basins to that and probably upgrading that system um, to have a better capacity to, to um, get some more runoff, basically, from the Fowler Road. Uh, we will be working very closely with the DOT and the DEP to make sure that the outlet is suitable given the proximity of uh, Great Pond and Alwife Brook. Um, so the short answer to you, I don't believe they'll have any, they'll see any impact. That's an okay. existing underground system. So the most we would do is make the pipes larger or smoother to, to handle more flow. We have to go over private property to access those pipes to we My understanding is that all the drainage system is in the existing right-of-way. We're yeah. going to try to accomplish all the work for the project within the right-of-ways that are present today. We've had a lot of complaints over the years from residents of Jewett Road about drainage, and particularly I can think of one that I've probably received 20 phone calls on over the years is, is folks that are, that are pumping out their basements, and the water then is just cascading onto the road and then going down and icing up at the folks' driveways. And, uh, you know, I would think the residents would see this as an improvement. We will, you know, as the project evolves, you know, as we're doing for Broad Cove, uh, is having a neighborhood meeting sometime with uh, all the folks on the Fowler Road corridor, as well as, uh, you know, wherever the drainage impacts are to outline what the project will be with them. So uh, we, we understand all their issues and concerns as well. Yeah, thank you. And then no more questions. Um, on item number six to e either Steve or Bob? What the, the request is, is that you uh, approve the scope of the project as outlined in the March 20th letter from OST Associates and that you authorize the town manager to sign the necessary documents to affect the project, uh, provided that it's within budget. And it so will all be bid out and the rest of it. So moved. You said it very well. Second. <laughs> it's moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? This is voting to authorize the manager to enter into the documents that we need to get accomplish this task. Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None? Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for coming tonight. Items? Just, yeah. As a, as a side, we, I have in the Broad Cove meeting uh, April 11th at St. Bartholomew's Church at 7.30, and Steve and Bob will be there to answer any questions that Residents have, and just a reminder, the councillors are also invited at the meetings at St. Bartholomew's Church in the, in the hall there on uh, the That's 11th. That's the day after tomorrow, right? The day after tomorrow, Wednesday night. What time? 7.30. And they've all been notified, so? Sent notice to everyone in Broad Cove, and then some of the folks uh, up on Route 77 as well. Okay. And on Two Lights Road. Okay. Since there may be some traffic impacts during construction. All right. Item number 87. A request to approve, uh, approve Fort Williams Parks events. There are three events. We'll take them as Pond Cove Elementary School Field Days, the week of June 4th. The People's Beach to Beacon Road Race events, August 4th. Setup begins on August 2nd. And the Pond Cove Parents Association's Old Time Circus, which is on August 13th. In your packet is a letter from each one of those organizations and also uh, notified on each one of those letters is the fact that each one of these events has been approved by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. So, um, I'd move approval of uh, each I'd event. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Item number 88, request to provide in-kind services for a composting grant. Um, 
You want to do this, Mike? Go ahead. No, it's all right. Um, mostly, it's our equipment that we're going to use. Is our in-kind contribution is for. Uh, I don't know. Is Bob gone? Right, yeah. Is the is the equipment? Is the front end loader and the backhoe, including an operator, for a two-day period in the summertime? Too bad Bob's gone. But what was his? <laughs> recommendation on this he, he thinks this is a fine idea but it is a little unusual arrangement and you know usually would just do something like this uh, but you know we like the idea of evaluating another way to handle waste paper and some of these other materials and we think it's a worthy project and a good experiment and he supports uh, the two-day use of either a front-end loader or a backhoe including an operator so it's only for a two-day period in the whole summer. Mm -hmm. that's, only, that's the only time he would need our uh, equipment. Okay. So it's not on a regular basis. No, this is just an in-kind contribution to this. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I just prove that, that, yeah. I mean, you already said that it was a good idea to experiment with some ways to deal with the cardboard and, and all. But I mean, Recycling cardboard and paperboard is very expensive because of it's so light and, and it's very expensive to transport. So if we could keep it here, we could save a lot of money and if it, if it can be worked into compost. So I think this is great and I think this is a neat technology institute, mm. you know, idea to, to fund some things that could be, uh, have some commercial. Uh, importance. I'm sure the council can find some way, to, something to do with any savings we might have. <laughs> all right, it's been moved and seconded. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor? Approved. All those opposed? None. Thank you. Um, request to, to approve the May 1st, 2001 municipal election warrant. The town clerk, please. Thank you. It will be in, in order this evening for council to sign the municipal election warrant. It calls for the election on Tuesday, May 1st at the Cape Elizabeth High School Gymnasium. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And I just may add, anyone that wants to or cares to vote an absentee ballot may do so. The ballots are available at my office. If you can't make it in, please call and we will send you a ballot in the mail. John and Ruth ought to make the motion on this one, shouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why, we probably shouldn't make the motion. <laughs> yeah. So moved. Thanks. So so moved and second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the May 1st, 2001, the municipal election date with the times as stated. Any further discussion? All those in all favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. The motion carries. Early vote often, right? Vote early and often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Item 90, request to approve the acceptance of a 2,500 rural community fire protection grant. You have a letter in your packet. This is very nice. Uh, yeah. Just for a minute, uh, this is for backpack pumps, hand tools, portable radios, hose, you know, things we'd be buying anyway. And I, I really, I don't know what Nomex is, but I, <laughs> I want to uh, the thank the fire chief for, for this because what you don't know, what you don't see here is he sent in this application asking for this money and it was denied. And he appealed back to them and saying, why was it denied? And it was, it you know, Cape exactly. He said <laughs> it, that they thought Cape Elizabeth really wouldn't need the money. And he said that they were, uh, it was unfair to the taxpayers of this community that we do have many taxpayers who are struggling. And uh, he, he persisted and they changed their mind and awarded it. So. Madam Chairman, I as a public taxpayer, I would like to uh, move the acceptance of the $2,500. Second. We moved and second in discussion. Council no McGinty. Fire retardant clothing. Uh, I, I would like to commend the chief for his, yeah. his uh, efforts <laughs> to pursue this. It's been moved and seconded. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. Item 90. Request to approve, whoop, request to authorize the town manager to sign a quick claim deed for property that was formerly RO4 dash, dash lot 59E, but is now clarified to be in South Portland as a result of the recent boundary <coughs> perambulation. Point of order, I, Madam Chairman. I think you said 90, and this is item 91. In case item 91. Any, Sorry. And keeping score. I would ask the clerk, please, to <coughs> comment on this. Thank you very much. 
few weeks ago, I was preparing um, a foreclosed property list for the town manager's office, and looking down through it, it occurred to me that this property probably was very close to the South Portland line, or I, I knew it was. And I wondered if it had anything to do or any effect from um, the boundary survey. So I went to the assessor, he did some research, went to the manager, and lo and behold, <laughs> yes, and it's no longer in our community, which is good, so we can get it off the rolls. So in any event, it would be in order this evening for you to authorize the manager to sign the quick claim deed um, to that property. I move that the manager be authorized to sign a quick claim deed to that property. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Is there, a, is there a house on this property, or is it just vacant land? Basically what it was is there's a, a sliver, I think it was $40 a year in taxes that they paid <laughs> to us, so the house was, and most of the land was in um, South Portland. It was just a little sliver in the cave back along. Thank you. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you, the motion carries. Item 92, request to approve a utility location permit from the Portland Water District for an eight inch water main under Old Ocean House Road at Whaleback Way. You have in your documents there, in your packet, an application. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the application for the water main. Is there any further discussion? I'd like to ask that would not there. Jordan. It's not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know I was ready. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. Now, the next items are all related to the uh, budget and the budget process, which I will ask the finance chair to make the motion for. We're going to vote on item number 44, and then we're going to vote on a new word that I know. We're going to set these, of course, for public hearings, what we're voting to receive. The new word is en bloc. En, oh. en bloc. En bloc. En bloc. En bloc. Well, E-N-B-L-O-C-K, which is when you take them in a group. Um, I don't think there's any K on it, actually. It's technical. B-L-O-C. B-L-O-C. B-L-O-C without the K. <laughs> take you as a group. <laughs> All right. That's item number five. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. 90, 93. I'll just read it. <laughs> Receipt of the report of the Finance Committee on the proposed fiscal year 2002 general fund budget and setting of a public hearing for Monday, May 14th, 2001, at 7.30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. That is the item. Could I make a comment? You certainly can. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as Finance Chair, I'd like to thank the Council, uh, Manager McGovern, Paulina Portria, who all were of great help in our working on the municipal budget. And on the school side, I'd like to thank Tom Forsella, Kevin Sweeney and the rest of the school board. Um, everyone worked very hard, examined their various budgets very carefully. Um, we all tried to always keep in mind the goal of providing the best balance of services for Cape Elizabeth citizens at the best possible price and the best possible tax rate. Um, on, because of decreased revenues from the state on the both, both the municipal and school side, as well as a number of unfunded mandates, um, increases in utilities and a, an assortment of other things. This has been a very difficult year for Maine municipalities, Cape Elizabeth among them, but we are certainly not alone. Um, the tax rate changes, I, I'm not going to go through everything, but I just want to highlight for viewers that um, overall expenditures for all the budgets merged together um, increased 4.89 percent. However, revenue overall for all the budgets merged together, decreased 1.77%. As a result, net to taxes, the amount, the dollar amount went up 8.09%. And due to some creative budget management techniques on the part of the manager and, and others, the total tax rate um, is increasing, it was proposed to increase by 6.9%. That's a dollar 40 increase, which would bring us up to 2170. Uh, total tax rate, so uh, the, per 1,000 of valuation. So as I said, it has been a very difficult and challenging budget year. I think next year probably will prove to be challenging also, but I think everyone uh, on the town council and the school board and various staff and department heads have worked manfully to uh, try to mitigate any problems for taxpayers. 
And that's it. Um, well, I would like to move that uh, we receive the report of the Finance Committee on the proposed fiscal year 2002 general fund budget and set the public hearing for Monday, May 14th, 2001, which is the regular town council meeting at 7.30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we set this budget for the regular meeting of the town council on May 14th. Is there any more discussion? Do we need to include all the figures in, or not? That'll be included in the motion. In the motion, the motion. The yeah. motion. Okay. For purposes of moving this to public hearing, I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Is that it, <laughs> For purposes of what, Councilor McKenzie? <laughs> Setting this for public hearing. Oh. He's receiving the report. Right. He's expressing no opinion on the budget right. as, as, <laughs> as of this point. Although I, I, would, I would like also, this is probably the first year I've really been comfortable with the, working with the school board on their budget. I think they did an excellent job. And, Tom's here to hear that. Maybe you can pass that along if they're not at home listening. But um, they certainly did an excellent job, best I've seen since I've been on the council. They did. They oh, did. Agree. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank that you. Was, yeah. That wasn't to imply that the finance chair didn't do a good job on the town council side. I didn't mean, <laughs> I didn't mean it that I, way. I didn't take it that way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know it's getting late, but I, I want to thank the council. I. Uh, this what has been a very difficult budget process. I think the council showed a lot of fiscal uh, acuity mm -hmm. and courage in, in looking at giving a strong look at some of my revenue projections, which as time went on proved to be uh, inappropriate. They were not, uh, they were overly optimistic, a, a situation that I really didn't like. But I think the council really took a very strong leadership role. Uh, Ann swift Kiata, uh leading the committee, but the entire council in uh, forcing another look at that. And uh, I really appreciate that because I think it, it was important to do. And, uh, you know, the, the, we do need to have a, a good financial stability for the town. I also want to mm -hmm. thank, you know, at a personal level, uh, Tom Fasella, the superintendent of schools, uh, who, uh, you know, there are many communities where the managers and the superintendents, when it comes to budgeting, go off and uh, totally opposite directions and you know we've always had a good experience here of uh, managers and superintendents working together and Tom was you know kind of fresh at this last year but this was the first year that he was you know fully immersed in the budget process uh, was to a certain extent but where I think he got to see a lot of the municipal side and how that works as well and I really appreciate uh, all the cooperation that he showed throughout the process uh, as well as uh, members of his staff and the entire municipal staff. So. Tom would you like to come and take a bow? Thank you. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion now to take items 94 out of 94 to 100 as a group. Yeah. So moved. Second. Councilor McGinty seconded it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. To set it for public Just hearing. To uh, we're going to take them up as a group first of all. We're going to vote to take them up as a group. Oh. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Thank you. Now, item. <coughs> 90, who's going to make that motion? I, I can make that motion. Um, <laughs> I move that we receive the following reports and set them all for public hearing on Monday, May 14th, 2001, at 7:30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall. And the reports that we are receiving include for fiscal year 2002. The sewer fund budget, the Riverside Cemetery fund budget, the Spurwink Church fund budget, the Fort Williams Capital fund budget, the Thomas Jordan fund budget, the Rescue fund budget, and the Museum at Portland Headlight budget. Well done. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on those items? Receiving and the setting for public hearing. Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. That concludes the regular items on our agenda. Is there any discussion of items not on the agenda by citizens? Hearing and seeing none. Madam Chairman, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to say that uh, on April 7th this year, a couple of days ago, uh, I completed 40 years of residence on Two Lights Road in Cape Elizabeth. Uh. And for every one of those 40 years, there has been in February a sawhorse in the middle of <laughs> Two Lights Road. And this year, thanks to the good efforts of Michael McGovern and Bob Malley and his crew, 
during the entire month of February, there was no sawhorse no on, <laughs> on, on Two Lights Road. And I'd like to express our appreciation for that. All the All snow is not melted yet. All mm. things come to those who wait. <laughs> <laughs> I've waited long enough. Oh. Okay, we're going to ask you, it, while we're still in session of the public hearing, Councilor yes. Barry, what the pin is, says. What, what the what? The pin on your lapel. Oh, this, this pin, well, it's one that is for the town of Cape Elizabeth, which was given to me kindly by the uh, town manager. And this one says, uh, I am celebrating my new grandbaby, who was born Friday morning at 1.36 a.m. Oh, that's uh, very nice. Very nice. That makes, that makes number eight. I did that as public, so that's in the public record. <laughs> <laughs> now, entertain a motion for adjournment. Oh, I, just, oh. I, I just had one meeting that's coming up. The first um, meeting of the Community Center oh. Committee is going to be on the 12th at the town hall at 7.30. Any interested people? Okay, great. Our student representative, do you have anything to add to our evening? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Oh, we, we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. Who moved and seconded? Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, none. The motion carries. We are adjourned. We are not off the air yet because he's not here.